War is hell, the movies tell us. And so was World War I. As depicted in the Netflix film All Quiet on the Western Front, the Great War is muddy, bloody, and brutish. No heroes here, just scared young boys killing or being killed. It's not a new story. In fact, the Netflix film from director Edward Baga is the third version of All Quiet on the Western Front, following two American takes, a 1979 TV movie from director Dilbert Mann and the 1930 classic by Lewis Milestone. All take inspiration from the German novel, All Quiet on the Western Front, or Investen nichts Neues, by Erich Maria Ramach. Published nearly a century ago, the book's message on the senselessness of war has sadly lost none of its relevance. Sie werden sich als würdige Träger dieser Uniform erweisen. Und die gegnerische Front in Flandern durchbrechen. One of the book's opening scenes shows young students being fired up by their jingoistic professor, who indoctrinates them with propaganda, pushing them to sign up for the front. Unsere Zukunft, die Zukunft Deutschlands, liegt in den Händen seiner größten Generation. Meine Freunde, das sind Sie! Darum aus in den Kampf für Kaiser, Gott und Vaterland! Yeah! I think it feels like a universal message about young kids being manipulated by demagogues and populists and hate speech to sort of go with, you know, enthusiasm and innocence and 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 they're full of youth to to the front and to see that youth and that innocence being mangled up and being torn apart being killed by and their souls being killed I think it's just sort of it's just a very emotional universal topic the ongoing war in Ukraine gives All Quiet on the Western Front, the book and the films, a new poignancy. It's quite strange when you when you finish shooting a film and just one and a half years later, you see uh, pictures on the news that look like the place where you're just coming from. At the same time, you feel very very um, um, con confirmed in what you did because suddenly you realize we have to see this we have to deal with this topic with war over and over again because it keeps returning Erich Maria Remark served in the trenches of World War I he only saw six months of combat, but was wounded five times. Recovering in a military hospital, he began writing about his experiences, adding stories from fellow soldiers and invalids. The result was all quiet on the Western Front. The book tells the story of young Paul Boimer, a 17-year-old who gets drafted, or rather, enthusiastically enlists to go to war, just like his schoolmates. This enthusiasm for war was what made World War I so particular, that so many young men so enthusiastically went to war. War memoirs were nothing new, but Remark's book was different. He'd been a reporter, and instead of romanticizing battle, he described the violence and death in the trenches with an almost clinical precision. It's written in a very matter-of-fact, reserved tone. There are a few passages that are a bit sentimental, but what made it unique was this restraint. He didn't dramatize anything, just described the horror of war from the perspective of a simple soldier. Remark's novel and the literary language is very, very contemporary. If you read it today, it feels, it doesn't feel 100 years old. Sort of it, its language doesn't feel dated at all. The book was an instant success. Translated into more than 26 languages, it gave silent, traumatized veterans 
a voice. You have to remember, no one at the time was talking about the war. The soldiers who came back didn't talk about it, couldn't talk about it. Here was someone who gave them a voice. And for those who weren't in the war, it was a rare first-hand account. All Quiet on the Western Front sold more than 2 million copies in its first 18 months in print. Hollywood soon came calling. Lewis Milestone adopted the book for the screen trying to emulate the brutal authenticity of Remark's words in moving pictures. The result was one of the first and most powerful depictions of war on screen. I moved it! I moved it! All Quiet on the Western Front is, of course, a groundbreaking work of war cinema. It shows the ugly sides of war, in particular, the mass deaths on the Western Front. But Milestone acknowledged the difficulty of making a pacifist film without making war seem exciting. And so you see the machine gun, and then in a reverse shot, you see the people that are being mowed down as though it was the camera itself mowing the people down. And he can't get out of this problem, which is to say that he has to stage the very drama that he's also trying to criticize. It's a problem every adaptation has faced. How to make war seem as horrific as Remark describes it without making the battles look too thrilling. If the camera work is stunning, if the score is incredible, and it all comes together with uh, wonderful actors, it can um, happen, and I saw it in uh, war movies, that this is, um, it, it could tend to be an adventurous happening, you witness, as a member of the audience. Um, and. I thought we, we can't do this. It is not possible to do an advertising clip, uh, an advertising movie that advertises war. You can't do this, no. For the first German film of All Quiet on the Western Front, Edward Berger and his team were determined to make war as unheroic as possible. Every detail of the movie, the grimy mud and cramped trenches, the discordant music and the gut-wrenching violence, was designed to be unnerving, brutal, and above all, realistic. It was also very important to sort of to show violence that is identical, whether it happens to friend or foe. Sort of in, in Remark's novel and in our film, um, the death of an enemy is not a good thing. And the death of an enemy is not sort of less appalling than the death of a friend. Cut, cut, cut. After watching this movie, I guess no one wants to go to war anymore. And that's the, the thing we wanted to achieve. In 1930, the brutal battle scenes in the first film version had a similar effect. Hailed as an indictment of war, Lewis Milestone's epic went on to win two Oscars, including for best film. But in Germany, right-wing groups were on the rise. They saw Remark's book and Milestone's film as treason. In 1930, the Nazis were not yet in power, but Goebbels, who later became Minister of Propaganda, organized protests. They released mice into cinemas screening All Quiet on the Western Front and threw stink bombs. They exerted political pressure and eventually got the film first censored and then banned altogether. 
When the Nazis seized power in 1933, All Quiet on the Western Front was one of the first books they banned and publicly burned. The Nazis didn't like that the war was presented as a cruel event that destroyed people, that had nothing about the glory of war, about the strong Germans. The Germans, like everyone else, were shown as weak, as those who die. It wasn't a war-glorifying book, and it wasn't a glorifying film. It showed the cruelty of war, and that's not what the Nazis wanted. Instead, with their own propaganda films, the Nazis presented a romantic and heroic version of war, depicting battle as an adventure and death for the fatherland as glorious, a vision that would end in the butchery of World War II and the Holocaust. Decades later came the second U.S. version of All Quiet on the Western Front, this time in color for TV, and starring, as Paul Boimer, Richard Thomas, famous as the fresh-faced John Boy from wholesome American series, The Waltons. The film won an Emmy, but had little impact. Four years after the end of the Vietnam War, pacifism wasn't seen as a very radical stance. It's a reason, maybe, why the film didn't get that much international attention, although it's a very good film. Monsieur le Maréchal, ich bitte Sie um den Waffenstillstand. All three movies take liberty with Remark's original novel. But only the Netflix version adds a parallel storyline in which German Vice Chancellor Matthias Erzberger, played in the film by Daniel Brühl, brokers a peace deal with the French. In real life, German right wingers spun the armistice into a conspiracy turning Erzberger into a scapegoat. 72 Stunden vergehen. Da draußen sterben Menschen. Alors signé. A week later after you signed it, he they started the legend of of the backstabbing legend we call it. Like he we they said we would have won the war. Politics betrayed us. He he signed the peace away or he signed this war. We would have won. And 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 by and he betrayed the German nation and he was killed three four years afterwards by German nationalists by German terrorists uh, by na- or by national terrorists and and this gave sort of rise to the Nazi movement for me that was important to not only talk about the first but the but the basically <laughs> this one big conflict that 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 arose from it. Ich werde nicht kapitulieren. The film's ending has Paul Boimer dying in a final pointless assault minutes before the ceasefire, a battle not in the book or in the historical record. In the book, he's just a random victim, like so many. His death is only mentioned in passing in the last sentence. That's the laconic meaning of the title. It's all quiet on the Western Front, but Powell's life ends. The film is denied this by a dramatic ending that's not historically accurate. There was no such last battle. Whatever the film's artistic license, Remark's core message remains, as timeless as this Berlin memorial to all victims of armed conflict the reminder that there are no winners in war. It doesn't matter from which side you you take it, from the Ukrainian, Russian, uh, German, French, English side, everyone who's involved um, is getting destroyed somehow. I mean, it just starts with the opening four sentences in the book. I think it's on the first page that no matter if you survived, uh, survived the war, if you escaped the, the shelling, I think he's using that phrase, um, the grenades, uh, or not, if you're on the loser's side or on the so-called victory side, on the winner's side, um, your life is um, destroyed, devastated. And there are generations to come after you suffering from what you witnessed. Das ist hier alles wie ein Fieber. Keiner will es eigentlich und mit einmal ist es da. Wir haben sich gewollt, die anderen haben sich gewollt. Trotzdem sind wir dabei, trotzdem ist die halbe Welt feste dabei. Und Gott guckt zu, wie wir uns abschlagen. 
What do you think of the depiction of war in All Quiet on the Western Front, and how does the new film measure up? Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe.